so uh, I want to present uh, work that I did uh, as a postdoc in the evolutionary genomics unit at OIST. Uh, the name of my talk is Diet is the main factor affecting fungal gut microbiota of termites. First, I want to tell you why did we study termites and fungi together. Uh, so we know that there are uh, more than 3,000 species of uh, termites known. Uh, they make up 40 to 90 percent of insect biomass in tropics. They can feed on gradient of uh, decayed uh, materials containing cellulose, uh, such as grass, uh, wood, litter, soil. They also feed on lichens. And there are some species that have fungal gardens and feed on fungal combs. Uh, they are able to decompose 20% of uh, net primary production in savannas, but in tropical forests it is only 1-2%, to 2 although they consume like 30% of leaf litter. Fungi, on the other hand, are main decomposers of cellulose in boreal and temperate forests. So we think maybe these two groups can work together to help each other degrade cells, can fungi help uh, termites uh, uh, to degrade cells in their guts, can there be some fungal termite symbionts? Uh, to answer these questions, uh, we have taken more than 50 species of uh, termites. Uh, they are presented here by this uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, phylogenetic tree of termites. There are two big clusters uh, of uh, our samples, so-called uh, lower termites and uh, higher termites. Uh, lower termites are phylogenetically, uh, are like a basal group of termites uh, related to cockroaches. They have uh, protist symbionts uh, in their guts, which helps them to uh, decompose uh, cellulose and obtain carbon and nitrogen, uh, carbon and uh, energy from their food. Uh, they feed on uh, wood and they represent so called uh, feeding group uh, one. Uh, higher termites are more diversified and are uh, eco uh, evolutionary newer. Uh, they have bacterial symbionts in their guts and uh, they can have different diets like uh, macrothermitine are the fungal growing termites. Uh, they are associated uh, with this uh, specific uh, agaricales termite called uh, termitinaria. Uh, there are some uh, other groups that feed on soil or grass or wood. Uh, so um, uh, diet groups are defined on uh, morphology of termite gut and on the humification gradient that termites feed on. Uh, so we already know from uh, previous studies of uh, termite uh, uh, gut symbionts that there are about one third of uh, termite gut bacteria that uh, seems to evolve together with their host. They have this so-called cocodogenesis patterns this is the, uh, the phylogenetic tree of termites, and this is phylogenetic tree of a specific bacterium uh, from uh, termite guts. And you can see the patterns fit quite nicely. Um, uh, but on the other hand, uh, in other study of Michelin, uh, it was showed, uh, shown that uh, uh, termite uh, fun bacterial communities uh, uh, are affected mostly by diet. Uh, different uh, termite species from different uh, taxonomical groups clustered together based on their uh, diet, basically. So we asked uh, which fungi are present in termite guts, what is diversity of fungi in termite gut, are there some differences in fungal diversity between termites with different diets? Uh, what are the factors affecting assembly of fungal communities in termite guts? Uh, this is just a picture of uh, fungi from cow's gut. I didn't find any from termites gut. Uh, so methods we used uh, were uh, my seek sequencing of uh, ITS2 marker and uh, LSU uh, fungal marker 
we have used uh, rarefied sequences for most of the analysis. We process data in uh, Chime 2 and R. Uh, so from alpha city, uh, from LSU and ITS uh, markers, we can see the same patterns, uh, like uh, lowest uh, diversity of uh, fungal species is in so-called lower termites, uh, uh, wood feeding group one, a uh, little bit higher diversity is uh, in the higher termites, uh, wood feeding group two, and uh, highest diversity is in cell feeding termites. Uh, evenness for both markers is following this pattern uh, with uh, soil uh, feeders be uh, communities uh, being uh, significantly more even than uh, in lower termites. Uh, when we did PCAs, uh, PCOAs from ITS and LSU markers, uh, we saw that soil feeders represented by blue circles and pink diamonds uh, clustered together apart from uh, wood feeders. Uh, also, when we built a tree from uh, fungal LSUs, uh, we uh, found there uh, most of uh, termite, uh, most of fungal sequences uh, coming from termite uh, are representants of Ascomycota, some are representants of Basidiomycota, uh, Chytridiomycota, Mucoromycota, or Glomeromycota. Uh, there is this uh, weird branch uh, on the tree that are probably some uh, mitochondrial LSU sequences because it's a mixture of ASCO and basidiomycota together. Uh, so fungal sequences from termites uh, on the tree are colored according to their taxonomy. And you can see uh, the colors are quite well mixed up. Uh, but there was this one clade uh, which seems to have cocodogenesis with uh, termites and uh, the closest uh, related uh, uh, identifications were microsporidia, which are unicellular parasites. Uh, they are usually specific for uh, groups of related taxa. They are anaerobical. Uh, this is just a picture from microsporidium from termites. And uh, in conclusion, uh, we saw that composition of uh, fungal communities is largely affected by diet of termite species, uh, but the uh, clade of fungal species close to microsporidia seems to co-evolve with termites. Higher termites and soil feeders have more diverse fungal communities than lower termites and wood feeders, respectively. Fungal communities between lower and higher termites are significantly different. Uh, there is also a huge unknown fungal diversity in termites. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so much, Lucia. Does anybody have questions for Lucia? You can type it in the chat. You can just type a question mark and I'll call on your name and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, if not, we're going to move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is <laughs> next speaker is um, <clears throat> NAK Not. NAK is the student at the University of Amsterdam, and she is going to talk about her work on barcoding nematopes using MinION. Cool. Um, let's see. Hi, guys. Just. <laughs> Trying to get the, um, wait, yeah, can you guys see um, the screen? Can someone just shout? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so hi guys, thanks uh, for this opportunity. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna uh, share with you some stuff I've been doing for my PhD, which is DNA barcoding of nematodes using the MinION and the Benso lab, so a fully portable set up. Um, I would just want to give you a bit of background to my PhD research and why we started with it. Um, um, 
I'm interested in in my PhD in great apes and all four taxa of great apes are endangered or critically endangered, um, partly due to poaching, deforestation. Um, but the threat I'm looking at is um, their health. There uh, has been uh, growing evidence in the last few years that um, yeah, there is a lot of disease risks for great apes as well, um, and um, yeah that there's more need for monitoring their health um, and um, the the current way of, anal of, of analyzing their health usually is collecting samples in the field um, flying them back transporting them back to a lab uh, you have a big massive lab set up uh, and that's where you do your analysis um, and uh, this process can take months uh, if not years before uh, all the samples are, are analyzed um, and um, what in my PhD we're interested in is, is looking if we can cut uh, that time uh, shorter and we can uh, try and, and uh, have a setup um, that's a bit faster than that. Uh, so we were using DNA sequencing uh, and we've also tried to focus on being able to use uh, the methodology we're developing for non-invasive samples because with great apes um, you, you want to be able to get the samples um, non-invasively to not cause them any additional stress. So uh, that would give you more like a timeline like this, where you collect the samples um, and you have, I don't know if you can see my, no. So the, the, the orange and white thing there is a bento lab, which is a fully um, uh, portable molecular biology lab. And then on the, on the right, you see uh, a minion setup. So then you could do everything in days on site. Um, so that's what we were uh, aiming for. Um, I am using nematodes as model organisms because I'm not a virologist. I'm a behavioral biologist by training and um, I don't want to work in a four class, a class four lab. Um, so by focusing on nematodes as model organisms, we could still um, develop a whole methodology that we can adapt for other things, but we can just do it in a normal lab um, with a little bit less, you know, I don't have to wear a hazmat suit. That's great. Um, oh, and so Sorry to this. Yeah. I think we're a couple of slides behind. We just got to oh. the question one. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, which are you? What are you seeing now? The research question one or? We tell us model organism right now. Okay. Okay. So it's good to know that there's maybe a bit of lag in the. So we didn't get to um, the lab setup. Right. Well, there will be more pictures of the lab sets up. So um, I uh, that I will, but I, I will browse through the slides a bit slower then. Um, so the research questions, I'll just put them all three up there um, here then. So the, the main question we wanted to first answer is, can we genetically identify nematodes using the MINI and does it all work? Um, we wanted to compare the quality of the MINI data with uh, Sanger data. Um, and we wanted to validate the bento lab for use in the field. So I'll first walk you through the, the, the validation of the minion and then I'll talk about the bento lab. So we uh, looked at three different nematode species, Anasaka simplex, um, Panagrelis redivivus, and Turbotrix aceti. Uh, one of them is a marine parasite. The other one is uh, can be a comparative um, model for strongloidus, which is a great ape nematode uh, parasite, and the other one is uh, uh, a free-living nematode. We used DNA barcoding um, and we used um, 18S primers that, um, let's see, yeah, I, I, I have that written on the other slide. Um, for the Sanger sequencing, we just sent it to Eurovin Genomics, um, used four peaks to look at the electrophorograms and use CView to create the consensus sequence of the Sanger sequencing. And then for the MINION bioinformatics, um, we uh, were base coding using Guppy, which is the standard software from uh, Oxford Nanopore Technology with a minimum quality score of seven. Uh, we demultiplexed the samples, so we ran all three species on one flow cell. We demultiplexed it also with copy, but we did a second round with pork chop. And then we, we um, trimmed the index and the primers uh, also with pork chop. And then we used the 
OM track pipeline, which is developed by Maestri et al, uh, where all this pre-processed reads I just told you about, you can just put that in this pipeline um, with your raw data and it gives you uh, a con consensus sequence, which is great because I'm not a bioinformatician. So that was really helpful. Um, and um, then I could just run the consensus sequences against BLAST. So to give you a bit of details about the MinION run, um, we had uh, more than a thousand cores available for sequencing. Uh, for you who are not uh, familiar with MinION sequencing, uh, I think there are more than 2000 cores technically available on a MinION flow cell, but they, the company gives a guarantee if there's at least 800 um, pores available for sequencing, then that's a good flow cell and you're expected to get good quality uh, results. So um, we had amplicon sequencing and that goes super fast. So within 10 minutes, we had more than 100,000 reads. So we stopped the sequencing. Um, and then uh, in the end, we used roughly 60% of these raw reads. Uh, they survived the base calling and the demultiplexing. So we used that for, for the consensus sequences. Um, so this is um, the, the, the results, the gray, shaded area you can see are the so what you see on the x-axis is the percentage id compared to the Sanger consensus sequence and on the y-axis you see the frequency of reads so the the gray area is the raw reads that we got from our experiments um and you can see and the, the slight dotted line is the um at the average um percentage identity of our raw reads compared to the Sanger sequencing. So it's quite um, low, it's roughly 88% or something like that. But you, uh, the red line gives the, um, the improvement of our accuracy after bioinformatics. And um, as you can see on this, these two slides as well, for two species, we've got a 99.9% .9 accuracy with the MinION reads. Um, and for the for the third species, we got let's see if yeah we got a hundred percent accuracy. So this is great because we only had ten minutes of of sequencing and we get these kind of uh, results with the bioinformatic pipeline. Um, so that was good. We 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 answered our first two research questions. Yes, we can genetically identify nematodes using the MinION, and and the data seems to be um, good enough as well. Um, and then we were thinking, okay, if we want to do this in the fields, uh, can we then use the bento lab, a fully portable molecular lab, um, to do this? So this is the bento lab. Uh, it's a, a small, it's kind of the size of an A4 paper. Um, and uh, you can do DNA extraction on there. You can do PCR amplification and then uh, gel electrophoresis. So that's what we set out to do. The pictures I'm going to show you aren't from the actual experiments. I actually went to Indonesia to train some veterinarians there in molecular biology. So we used the Bento lab for that. Um, and uh, well, we did the DNA extraction, we did the PCR, um, we did gel electrophoresis. We used um, a camp sto camping stove to melt our gel, uh, our, our gel um, and, uh, and we ran it. Um, and then we prepared the MinION library on the Bento lab as well, and uh, and we performed the sequencing. Um, so uh, the experiments I did this with was with C. elegans, and it was before I went out to to Indonesia to train the vets, and we were uh, just looking to see if everything worked. Um, so I used a very old flow cell. I used it twice before for 26 hours, um, and it was um, kind of dying. So you can see that there were only 43 uh, pores available for sequencing. Um, but I went ahead nonetheless, because I just wanted to know, did the DNA extraction on the Bento lab work? Did the PCR work? Did the library preparation work? And uh, in 14 minutes, we got two and a half thousand reads, after which um, it really stopped generating data. So we stopped the, the, the experiment. Um, and of those two and a half thousand reads, we only were left with 500 uh, reads after demultiplexing. So you can also see that the, the quality of the data was worse in this uh, experiment. Um, but still, the, the, the um, bioinformatics improves it. The, there's, this figure has the same scale as the figures you saw before. Um, so you can see there's 
hardly any gray. It means there's not a lot of reads. And the, the average accuracy of our, our raw reads compared to the Sanger was, uh, was lower. Um, but the ONT track still uh, improved the results. It improved it to 95.6% uh, accuracy. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I meant to mention this before, but we use the 18S SSU R R RNA gene. Um, we use two different primers. So for uh, the previous three uh, nematodes, we used uh, uh, a, a primer that was developed by Floyd et al. in 2005. And this was uh, one from 2000, his 2002 paper. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we managed to also sequence the C elegance. Um, so that was that was really cool um, that this worked. Um, that that was the main like everything worked. We, we were able to do um, the DNA extractions and and all the library preparations on the Benzo lab. Um, then in addition to that, we were looking at how we can keep the costs a bit down. If for example projects like the vets in in Indonesia want to do this themselves, so we three D printed. A magnetic rack uh, bringing the cost down by 90 percent and uh, instead of buying a vortex um, i used a multi-tool uh, and just use some duct tape and uh, use that for uh, as a vortex which works uh, quite well as well so the, the the questions i'm working on now um, for the rest of my pc is can we uh, sequence grade eight parasites in the field uh, can we actually use uh, use uh, para yeah, nematodes from great apes uh, and can we identify nematode species in a mixture such as me meta barcoding on the minion work uh, that's probably going to be a bit challenging bioinformatically but uh, we have some good hope um, and then i'm really interested in in reducing so now we ex um, like the the point was first to extract nematodes uh, from for example feces and just look at the nematodes but ideally maybe in the future we would be able to just extract nematode dna directly from feces uh, without yeah so uh, that's something i would hope to look into later and uh, and then uh, like how can we use this portable setup like the portable setup is just a portable molecular lab really uh, if you use different parameters, you use different kits, you can answer different questions. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to adapting this protocol and, and seeing what kind of questions we can answer um, on field sites. So, yeah, I uh, want to thank some of my colleagues who have provided valuable feedback. Um, WWF, the Netherlands, funded the, my PC research just as the, the University of Amsterdam. Um, and yeah, um, I'm curious if you've got any questions. Thank you so much. Okay, questions for Nick Cape? Matt asks, what's the tool used for centrifuge? For the centrifuge? So yeah, that's the Bento Lab. Um, it's, yeah, it's literally called the Bento Lab. So, um, and uh, it, it, it is really cool, the, the centrifuge and uh, the PCR, everything is fully functional. So you can set the, um, uh, how do you call it, the centrifugation speed, so you can adjust it. So for example, my kit had to uh, go up to 12,000, is it RPM? I don't know exactly, but yeah, um, you can set it, uh, I think up to 8,000 G, that was it. Uh, so you just have to do your, your extraction protocols, like your centrifugation a bit longer to make up for that. But um, but you can set the, the G forces, so to say, and um, and the thermocycler same is like it's fully functional. You can set it to all different um, settings and it actually has capacity, the thermocycler for 36 samples. So mm -hmm. um, that's quite a, a lot. What's the thing that that was next to your 3D printed magnetic rack that you use for centrifuging. Oh, that was a multi-tool. Um, so let me, um, yeah, it's really hard to find. I was like, how do I describe this scientifically? Because <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't find them often in the research papers. Here's the picture. Uh, I'll, I'll share the screen again. Because I think there, there was another uh, uh, another question about that just now. So yeah, that's this. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Yeah. So it's a handheld uh, adaptive multi-tool. And the one of the things I was thinking is if you're in a country and you don't have access to a lot of um, fancy um, 
suppliers for fancy lab tech or these things are really expensive, then what can you find in any country that you can easily modify? So this is just a standard multi-tool. It's often used for cutting wood and, and, and things like that. Um, so you have a little, a few different parts that you can add to the top. Uh, actually, you can also just use it for sanding. I, I'm doing a DIY project now and I'm using it as a sander now. So it's, it's really multifunctional. Uh, but yeah, you can also just, if you use duct tape, it doesn't obviously have a lot of, you can only put like three Eppendorfs on it, but um, it does work um, as, a, as a vortex and it's, it's only 50 pounds, which probably is like $60. So, um, and you can probably find it anywhere in the world. Um, so that's great. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Juan has a question and he asks at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned you did multiplexing twice for Illumina data. Not sure if I got it wrong, but if you, you did, what is the reason for that? Um, let's see, multiplexing. So I don't know if that was a, a miscommunication, but I didn't do any Illumina uh, sequencing. So I only, um, I only used Minayan, um, and I, uh, let's see, I did multiplexing twice for the Illumina data. Ah, right, yes. Actually, um, I did de I demultiplexed twice. I did it once with Guppy and a second one with Porchop, and I think that's what your question is about. Um, yeah, uh, I, I just uh, used, I followed some other research that has done that, and it's basically to make sure, I think with Guppy, you can't really modify your, um, how specific you want to, or how stringent you want to de um, demultiplex. Uh, whereas with Porchop, you can um, set that you want both um, indexes to be recognized. So if you have an Amplicon that uh, has uh, an index on both sides, but it only recognizes it on one side, it will eliminate it from your data. So basically it just um, helps you to filter out only the, the high quality reads that uh, have in, an index on both sides so that it Im improves the, the chances of um, putting it in the right bin, so to say. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Cool, thank you so much. Okay. Cool. Okay, uh, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Our next speaker is Natalie Graham. Natalie is an OLAP mate of mine. She's a student at Berkeley and she's going to talk about her study on Hawaiian plant arthropod communities using metaphor coding. Hi, everyone. Uh, thumbs up on the uh, presentation being viewable. Uh, not yet, maybe there's still lag. Um, I think we're seeing your screen. Hmm. Um, so we're seeing ourselves right now. Let's try that again. Okay, now you're okay, great. Um, all right, so yeah, as uh, Athena said, we were we used to be youth, you, uh, lab mates, and uh, I am currently a PhD student with Rosemary Gillespie um, at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, today, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about some questions that I've been thinking about for my PhD dissertation. Uh, so, thinking about how our community is structured through time. And, um, and do universal principles um, exist that kind of have to do with this process of community assembly? So if we think about a community that's 40 years old uh, versus a community that's 5 million years old, uh, kind of one central challenge in biology has been trying to disentangle the effects of historical processes to those that are taking place currently. Uh, and 
There's been models that have been developed that are looking at this dynamic process and how biodiversity is being shaped, but there's been little empirical evidence to test these models. Uh, what we need is we need a system that allows us to isolate the effects of time and uh, remote oceanic archipelagos, uh, specifically those that are formed over hotspot volcanoes, provide that. So in essence, we can use the substrate age as a proxy for community age. And so what we've done is we've gone to uh, the islands of Hawaii and we've sampled at 12 different sampling sites across four different islands. We sampled uh, several replicates for each and at each site, we sampled in proportion uh, to the plants that were there. So each sample is a plant arthropod community. We also took care to be able to just sample the native forest, similar elevation, similar precipitation, so we could really just look at the effect of time. And we do um, quantitative metabarcoding, and I say quantitative because we really took some care to try to be able to get at the abundances in these communities, because for understanding um, community formation, it's important to be able to, uh, to have that as a variable. So the first thing that we did was we took our, our uh, arthropod community sampled from the plants and we uh, sorted them into different size categories. And for each of those size categories, we counted the number of individuals that went in. Uh, then we performed um, uh, some a dual indexing PCR and you use, we used a cytochrome oxidase one gene, which is the barcoding region, but we used two different amplicons. Uh, and each of those amplicons uh, preferentially will uh, amplify different taxonomic groups. And then we sequenced on the aluminum MySeq, and uh, we did some processing as well. So uh, we removed pseudogenes. Um, we uh, took the samples and confirmed the blast hit by doing phylogenetic clustering. Uh, and then we also um, rarefied the sequences based on the count of individuals that were in the sample. So our overall data structure looks like this, where we have a number of different forest sites. For each forest site, we have samples from each plant. For each plant sample, we have these different size sorted categories and counted, and then we see sequenced two amplicons, and then collectively, uh, we rarefied by count. So we have a data set that we feel fairly confident about, um, but one question that we kind of might wanna start with is, does a sequence abundance make a good proxy for counting individuals. And uh, we can see that in some groups, the relationship of the um, OTU count to OTU abundance is very strongly correlated, uh, whereas in other groups, um, there's a slightly different relationship between the count of individuals at the site versus the sequence abundance. And this could be happening for a variety of biological reasons. I can tell you um, that the Hymenoptera, for instance, at the youngest sites, that that uh, larger number of sequences that you see has to do with the ants that are at that site. And so when you have gregarious insects, you might have a higher number of sequences than, um, than you would be counting per plant. We can also look at the proportion of taxa and uh, how the abundances are changing over time for each group. And, um, and we can see that there are some significant uh, changes in the abundances um, among taxa. And we can go back in, of course, and test this with uh, ANOVA and with uh, post hoc tests like a Tukey's test. Uh, and we can also look at the proportion of taxa and how that changes over time. And we can infer you know, some questions about how the ecological roles of these groups um, as they're shifting in abundances uh, might affect the overall community. Uh, likewise, we can look at changes in richness over time. So the expectation might be that as time goes on that you see a linear increase in the number of, of taxa that are there, but um, we don't always see a linear uh, relationship between time and richness. In fact, what we most often see are richness peaks at the intermediate sites. We see that kind of in two different patterns where you have um, either an early peak and then a, a dip and then another increase in richness uh, or an increase in richness kind of at the later sites and then a dip at the um, at the oldest. And then we also see some anomalous patterns that um, we're not 
exactly sure how we can explain it this time, but there's, this is the individual richness pattern. Similarly, we can look at the diversity with something like a Shannon's diversity, which is sensitive to the rare species in the community. And uh, we can look at how uh, it does not always increase linearly with time. And again, what we most often see are um, peaks at the intermediate age, uh, with some communities actually having the highest uh, diversity at the youngest ages. And we can take these types of data and we can ask about what our expectations would be against some sort of uh, model for the community being in stasis. And uh, so one such model is this uh, maximum uh, entropy theory. And so we can say, well, if our community is in equilibrium, do we see a deviation from that equilibrium or a de deviation from steady state? And uh, we do actually see uh, the greatest deviation from steady state in the youngest communities, suggesting that perhaps those communities are not have not reached stasis yet. But we also see a deviation at some of the oldest communities. In fact, the only one that perfectly conforms to uh, the expectations for Maxent is at uh, this middle-aged community on the volcano of Kahala. And we might like to approach this understanding of community structure through a different framework, and species interaction networks allow us to do that. Uh, so here we have just kind of a global view of some changes in network structure. Uh, each of those spheres, the size of the sphere, is the um, degree or the number of interactions that that taxon has. And you can see that um, it kind of meets our, ex thinking about our expectations for this, that we would have an increase in the um, link density over time. And perhaps that would be a corresponding increase in specialization. So as communities become uh, older, then they have more co-evolved relationships. Uh, we can test this by examining the link density. And what we see actually is, again, a peak of link density at the middle-aged communities. So um, again, not an, a linear increase. Uh, and older communities have these more co-evolved one-to-one relationships. Um, and communities that are younger have had less time for specialization. And so we actually see this average number of links being highest at mid-age communities. For um, another way to look at kind of ne network structure, uh, we can think about the nestedness of the community or what the distribution is of um, how specialists and generalists are interacting. And we see that there's actually higher nestedness scores uh, in the younger communities. And this suggests that maybe strong environmental filtering is taking place, which leads to this nestedness pattern, or sort of asymmetric pattern of generalists and specialists interacting with one another. And similarly, we can think about a metric of modularity. So modularity is thinking about communities that are modular in nature, and uh, therefore are mostly interacting with in, within their module, but then some interactions between. And we see an increase in modularity over time. We can um, then sort of do a deeper dive into thinking about how networks are changing by isolating certain groups of interests. And um, so spiders are a, a really nice group to look at. Uh, and Hawaii is a nice system to investigate this in because it's somewhat of a closed system, uh, given that it's a, a very long distance to get there and things that have gotten there have evolved together for a long time. And so when you have an introduced species, that species is, um, uh, likely having some novel interactions and um, changing the, the structure of the food web. And so here I've just highlighted the um, introduced taxa and all of the links that they have to their plant community and the prey community that's on that. We might also think about um, some cascade effects uh, or what like the susceptibility is of different communities. So here I've just um, plotted some bipartite networks of the Hymenoptera, and uh, we see that at the youngest community, um, ants, which are completely introduced in Hawaii, there are no native ants on the islands of Hawaii, uh, that they're in really large abundance in the younger communities and um, have uh, less um, of an effect on the interactions in the older communities. And this might suggest that perhaps older communities are more resistant to invasion. So um, thinking about community structure and uh, change through time, 
Uh, hopefully, I've shown you how um, we can use some of these tools of rapid biodiversity assessment and um, genetic biomonitoring. And if we couple that with a system that allows us to really get at the effects of time, uh, then we can start to unfold some of the patterns and process that are involved in all of this and uh, hopefully um, look at some conservation outcomes uh, to help with community welfare. And um, with that, I just would want to thank all of the wonderful people that helped with this um, and also to highlight that a lot of undergraduate um, labor went into sorting the specimens to size. Um, and so really, this was a very much a group effort.